folks. Welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI 121. This is House of Knowledge, the Library of Alexandria. So this is a bit of a different sort of topic for us today, um, looking at one institution in such depth like this, but it is a fairly significant institution and one that plays a major role in one of our enduring myths about the ancient period. So I think it is uh, an interesting exercise to try and unravel the myth that comes along with the history. So that's what we'll be doing today. All right. So the most important thing to remember about the Library of Alexandria is that what we know or think we know about it is as much myth as history. I don't mean that it was fictional. I mean that the idea of the library is as important, culturally speaking, as the reality of the library. The reason for this is that it, it began as an idea. So the Hellenistic rulers of Alexandria believed that encouraging and controlling scholarly research was a way of projecting their power and their influence. So the library was to serve a political purpose for them. Now the first detailed discussion of the library that survives is from a text called the Letter of Aristius from the second century BCE. And you'll be reading that for the Zoom session this week. And it talks, uh, among other things, about the project to translate the Septuagint, the Hebrew scriptures, into Greek. Uh, supposedly the same Septuagint comes from the king assembling and essentially sequestering 70 Jewish scholars until they finish the translation for him. Now, that story is apocryphal, but what it does is it links the origins of the library to Ptolemy I, who was one of Alexander's generals and successors. So after Alexander died, Ptolemy decides to secure Egypt as his own kingdom. And tradition tells us that he employed Demetrius of Phaleron, uh, a former student of Aristotle, uh, to establish his library in the early 3rd century. Now, this isn't a new idea. Uh, we know that many ancient kingdoms had extensive archives, uh, institutions that we might call libraries. There is evidence in the ancient Near East for several examples. You're reading an article about another for a tutorial this week. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that apparently the first idea for the library was from Alexander himself, not Ptolemy. Uh, you have old Persian and Armenian sources that tell us as much. And so if it came from Alexander, he would have been drawing on both Hellenistic and Mesopotamian traditions of archive work. So under Ptolemy, the goals of the project included collecting uh, all significant knowledge, specifically significant knowledge in Greek, or that could be translated into Greek. It was meant to be what we call a universal library, uh, to integrate the whole body of knowledge into a pan-Hellenic culture. You might call it an expression of cultural imperialism. So by doing this, the Ptolemies would gain prestige, they would gain cultural intelligence about their neighbors, and it would help them um, administer and rule Egypt. Now, essentially, what happens is that a whole industry of learning is created in Egypt. It's, it's very interesting. So, we can't talk in great detail about the organization of the library, because we don't know as much as we'd like, but we can talk a little. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is that we are actually looking at two institutions here, the library and the museum. Their purposes overlap, but their activities differ. The library is where the books were stored. The museum is where the scholars worked. And technically, by the way, it's museon. Technically, again, a shrine dedicated to the muses. So this is a reference to Athens, where a school had to have religious status in order to get legal protection, and also to Egyptian religious structure because the school was presided over by a priest, um, similarly to what we see in Egyptian temples. We believe it was located in the area of Alexandria called the Palaces in Greek times and the Brucheon in the Roman period. Strabo, who was one of the scholars who worked there, he was Roman, um, he wrote on geography, talked about the museum as having an eating hall where the, quote, men of learning came together to eat. And he says that they formed a community that held property in common 
what does this actually mean? Not entirely clear. Um, do they actually have a ban on private property? You know, if they are set up as a temple, that is possible. Unfortunately, we don't even know for sure if the scholars of the museum taught. The classical sources are just not helpful in some ways. We do know that they had several other tasks. They were composing new literary works, doing research, but they also created a whole new system of textual criticism. It's basically the first such system in the West. So they wanted to conserve, but also to amend and rectify the work of all Greek authors. And they initiated some practices of textual criticism that we still use today. So for instance, they uh, used marginal annotation. They put notes in the margins of the manuscripts. They defined the meter of poetry. They began the tradition of cataloging, which we'll talk about uh, in a few. Now, in order to attract scholars to stay there, the museum offered free board, lodging, servants, tax exemptions, and also really nice salaries. It's a way of keeping a sort of critical mass of scholars there at all times. Now, unfortunately, we don't know much about the library itself, and we don't know anything about its specific relationship with the museum. Classical texts never mention the two at the same time. Hard to say why. Possibly they weren't separate buildings after all, because that would make sense then that they weren't referred to separately. Uh, the only description we have of the operation of the library comes from much later. Uh, it's a 12th century writer, John Setzes, who's Byzantine. Now, because, it, however, he is a Byzantine writer who is preserving ancient fragments that we no longer have the full text of, we can at least consider it as evidence. So what he tells us is that the library edited various genres, and the Greek word he uses for edit uh, means textual comparison, the creation of additions, that sort of thing. Uh, the goal was to collect works in their pure and restored form. Now, we do know that there was a figure that was in a leadership position, sometimes called the guardian of books, sometimes called the director or the librarian. Uh, we have a papyrus fragment that seems to have been part of a school exercise from the 2nd century CE. It's not fully legible, but it claims to list the librarians of Alexandria. It may not be accurate. We have other lists from later sources. And when I say later sources, these are still ancient fragments that are preserved in these later sources, where there's a different order to the names and a few different names. But clearly, these guys were high-status scholars. If their names are being remembered as part of you know, an educational exercise that far down the line. So where we get some of the later lists is another Byzantine work called the Suda, which is an encyclopedia from the 10th century CE. The Suda is so important because it does preserve so many different fragments of ancient works. And uh, clearly, we can assume that none of these lists are actually full lists of all the librarians who ever served at Alexandria. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the uh, status of the library waned after some time. Uh, we do know that later on there was likely a second library. There was a 4th century text that suggests there was one at the original site and a smaller text at the Temple of Serapis. It's the only actual evidence that we have for it. We do know that the Serapium existed. It's been excavated. We also know that it was... Uh, modified considerably in the Roman period. So what we see now may not be what they saw at the time, but it's basically two long corridors opening up into small rooms. They could have been book rooms. They could have been something else entirely. So as I think you can see, the nature of this institution is a bit murky for something that has such a life in the popular imagination. So where did they get their texts and how many texts were there? So Tsetse's claims that the library had half a million texts of various types. He makes a distinction between mixed and unmixed texts. That's not entirely clear. Maybe the mixed ones are the ones that have more than one work in them. And it's likely that he's accurate in assuming that the mixed ones were the more numerous. Because, of course, these are not books, per se. They're not codexes. The codex doesn't become a thing for considerably longer down the line. These would be rolls, so parchment rolls, 
So there could be in many different texts included in the role. Are his numbers right? Who the heck knows? Ancient writers love to exaggerate numbers. But if you start to look at some of the other references to numbers of texts at the library, it's safe to say he may have actually been in the ballpark. So we are told in the first century CE, when there's supposedly a fire at the library, that it had 700,000 texts. Uh, we don't know how many titles that is. Certainly there would have been duplicates. Now Galen, who was a famous Greek medical writer and doctor, gives us some really interesting stories about the library. So, for instance, he tries to explain how a copy of a text called Epidemics, which is part of the Hippocratic medical corpus, turned up in the library at Alexandria, even though it belonged to someone in Sidon. So what he tells his readers is that Ptolemy II ordered that all ships that came to the harbor of Alexandria were to be searched for books. The books would be confiscated and copied. The originals would be placed in the library, and the owners would be given the copies. Now, he also says that the same Ptolemy convinced Athens to lend him the official copies of the plays of Sophocles, Euripides, and Aeschylus. He had to pay a huge security deposit for this, 15 talents of precious metal. And a talent, by the way, is about 60 pounds. So 60, 60 times 15 pounds of gold. 60 pounds times 15 of gold. That, that's a scary thought. That's a lot of money. But Ptolemy kept the originals, returned the copies, and just shrugged off the deposit. There are even some fairly nasty stories about envoys from the library doing underhanded things to get their, um, their hands on texts. So for instance, during a famine in Athens, we're told that some of these envoys actually forced people to sell their manuscripts in return for food. And Galen also suggests that Alexandria competed with the next biggest library at Pergamum, which inflated prices and led to forgeries being made. We'll talk more about forgeries shortly. Now, one of the other things that's really interesting that he mentions is how the books were actually entered into the library. It wasn't done automatically. It took some time. They had to be stored in warehouses first. And so if they had to be stored in warehouses, they had to be labeled. And the labels are the very beginnings of um, the catalog system. We know that such work was recorded because when you look at medieval manuscripts of classical authors, their notes refer to editions made by Alexandrian librarians and to manuscripts from different parts of the Greek world. So it's likely that some of the information the Alexandrians amassed was transmitted that way. Now, we've kind of danced around the subject of you know, non-Greek literature. This is not a universal library, it's in a really universal library. Certain types of knowledge, certain types of texts are going to be valued more than others. Now, there were Greek translations of works from other languages, but there were many fewer of them. They simply were not as interested in non-Greek literature as they were in different Greek, different examples of Greek literature. There were exceptions, the Septuagint, as I said. Um, also a very significant historical work from Egypt itself, uh, the writings of Manetho, who wrote a history of the kingdom in Greek, but who took material from Egyptian records. And Manetho is really, really significant. And we don't have the whole text of Manetho, but because he was stored in the library, we have big chunks that survive in later Christian and Jewish sources. We have a reference from Pliny the Elder about how there was a commentary written by one of the scholars on the verses of Zoroaster. So um, it kind of implies that the verses themselves had been translated from the original Iranian into Greek, but we don't have a lot of information on non-Greek literature beyond these stray references. There probably weren't that many translated works in the collection, just based on the fact that we don't see many in the surviving body of literature. If there had been more examples, we would still have more examples. All right, so how do we keep track of all of these tens or hundreds of thousands of texts? So the poet Callimachus, who is probably the greatest Hellenistic literary scholar we know, from the historical record, 
created what he called the Pinakes, and this translates as tablets or tables. It is a text that recorded every text the library possessed, but in abbreviated form. Basically, it's a catalog. We don't have the Pinakes, which is a great sorrow to me because it would be fascinating to see, but we can learn a fair amount about it from what's said about it in what other classical and medieval scholars said about it. So in this case, uh, we can refer to both the Suda and Zetses, as well as classical writers who give us some information about his work. So what we're told is that he divided his text into sections by genre and uh, subsections, each consisting of a list of authors. Within each section, the authors are listed alphabetically. Uh, each entry included a biographical sketch and a list of the author's work, listed by opening words or by titles if they had them, and an estimate of the number of lines the work possessed. So this is not a science. I mean, there are plenty of classical writers who wrote in many different genres. So where do you put them? That being said, we're told that the text was an instant hit and it was copied and passed around the Hellenistic world. Other libraries imitated the Panakes. The library at Pergamum did its own version. Uh, libraries at Rhodes did so, did so as well. Now, there's an interesting argument made by literary scholars about this particular innovation of Callimachus, and they say that he basically changed the textual world. So he creates these little summaries of texts, and by doing that, he creates some new texts that could be cited and used by other scholars. It's a little esoteric, but it is an interesting point. It's like every text develops a tiny baby clone, and that tiny baby clone can be used as a reference by other scholars. So I also talked about the appearance of forgeries, and this is not as clear-cut as you might think. There are, of course, different types of fakes and cheats. Sometimes they're unintentional. So part of the process of cataloging and classifying texts is making a judgment as to you know, who to attribute a text to. You could make a mistake and attribute it to somebody other than the actual writer. You could make a mistake just in writing down who the author was, you know, a completely unintentional scribal error. There are, of course, true forgeries, and we see a number of them that claim to be works by Aristotle. And the uh, period when the library was most active was also the period when we see the emergence of pseudo-Plato, so philosophical works pretending to be written by Plato. Uh, certainly the, uh, the problem is that the Ptolemies were so desperate to collect everything that they did give forgers incentive to create fakes. But uh, Galen claims that before Alexandria and Pergamum started competing for books, there were no forg forgeries. And that's nonsense because there are certainly plenty of misattributions and discussion of such things in the classical period. You have to kind of look carefully at what Galen was actually intending to say. And what he was intending to say, we think, is that works are only falsified when they're copied. So the first author is the author, whoever it might be. But because the library is all about transcribing and reproducing, that's what gives forgers the opportunity. Okay, so the burning or burnings of the library. Note the plural. This is because there is no single fire that destroyed it all, as far as we can tell. There are several. So let's go through them one at a time. The first damaging fire that we're told about was supposedly during Caesar's stay in Egypt in 48, and that should be 47 BCE. He was helping Cleopatra against her younger brother, obviously. Now, he set fire to the enemy ships, and it spread to the dockyards, then to the city itself. Seneca claims that 40,000 rolls in the library could not be saved. Plutarch says it was totally destroyed. That's the 1st century CE. In the 3rd century CE, Dio Cassius says that books were burned in the battle, but implies it was the books that were stored in the warehouses, not the books in the library. Uh, in the following century, Ammianus Marcellinus says that 700,000 books were destroyed when Caesar sacked the city, but also confuses the Serapium with the Bruchan Library. 
There are others I can cite, but I think you get the idea. The scope of the disaster, as it's discussed in our sources, has less to do with the actual damage done and more with the fact that it was perceived as a disaster. Yet, if you look at some of the actual sources from Caesar's day, they don't mention it at all. They note that uh, even the ones that do talk about books or rolls being burned, it's just books or rolls being burned. It's not the library itself. And certainly the work of the library continues. Uh, Strabo is there 25 years after Caesar. He doesn't mention any great damage or loss. So did the library actually burn during Caesar's time? It doesn't seem like it did. That being said, we do know that it went into decline in the Roman period. The emperors appear to have been patrons of a sort, however. They certainly uh, appointed the priest in charge. Uh, there are scattered references to emperors uh, sending scholars to consult books in Alexandria. Now, however, if there was a fire that was damaging, good chance it probably happened in 272. Uh, there was a great riot in the city uh, that year. Most of the Brucheon was leveled. Uh, the Emperor Aurelian was trying to suppress the revolt and things got out of hand. Um, again, however, that's just one of the potential two buildings, so it's certainly not the end of the library's operations under any circumstances. And we do know the Serapium itself was closed in 391 CE. Uh, the Patriarch of Alexandria got the Emperor's permission to close all the temples and expel the pagan scholars and philosophers, al along with the priests. This is uh, just after Christianity has made the official religion of the Roman Empire. Another potential destruction story, 415 CE. So this is when violence breaks out between the Jewish and Christian populations of Alexandria. And the prefect ordered the Jewish population to leave. But one of the Musaean teachers, Hypatia, who is often seen as being the last great scholar associated with the library, uh, protested and was murdered by the mob, who then supposedly burned it to the ground. But again, wh which library did they burn? We don't know. We don't know how much of Hypatia's story is even true. And finally, there is a thoroughly nasty and unfortunately very persistent tradition that the Arabs burned the books when they took the city in 642 CE. The only story that supports this is a rather fanciful one about the caliph using the books that disagreed with the Quran as fuel for the baths for six months. This is a story that appears 500 years after the conquest of Alexandria, so we can't really take it seriously. But what you see is a whole long list of times when the library may have been damaged, may have been burned. And yet there's no conclusive end until much later. So I think it's safe to say that the history of the library is considerably more complex than the myth of the library would have you believe. So the idea of the library as this great center for all of the learning in the world and when we lost it, we lost an incalculable amount of knowledge. It's not really well supported by the evidence, or at least we don't have evidence to support it. Certainly we would have lost knowledge on any of these occasions when tens of thousands of books are burned. Now, unfortunately, fires are a thing in ancient cities. You know, they just continue to be. Uh, even in Rome during its heyday, fires could be intensely damaging. Now, here's a movie I wanted to talk to you briefly about. Uh, it's from 2009. It's called Agora, and it is the story of Hypatia of Alexandria. So again, Hypatia is a female pagan philosopher who was murdered by a mob, and Realistically speaking, she was probably killed as part of a feud between the prefect of Alexandria and the patriarch. She was not killed because she was defending education and knowledge, which is unfortunately what the movie decides to portray uh, the circumstances as. Alexandria was a very unpleasant place to live in late antiquity, I would argue. There is so much strife in the city. During the period of Christianization, um, there's a lot of pushback against the new religion. And there's a lot of push from the new Christians against the pagan population. 
some of the more interesting things I found when I started studying this period is that there were apparently tens of thousands of attendants of the sick, and they were Christian clergy of some sort, and when they weren't attending the sick, they were just causing riots randomly. So there's a lot of civil strife in Alexandria, a lot of street violence. Alexandria is basically too big and too diverse for its own good, I would argue. Um, it's not a city that's under very effective political control in the period. Um, it's not a city where the emperor can really exert much influence. It's, it's too big. It's too much its own uh, organism, if you want to put it that way. Now, Hypatia has so often been seen as a symbol of the end of classical antiquity and the end of Alexandrian intellectual life. And this myth is linked to the story of the library, and it gets blown into something bigger. So not only is her death associated with the end of the library, it's all linked into the end of the glorious classical world at the hands of primitive and barbaric Christians. Now here comes the religious dark age. This is not historically accurate in the slightest. It's really not. But really, Hypatia has been used for so many centuries as part of anti-Christian propaganda, um, and specifically anti-Catholic propaganda during the Reformation, that there's no real detaching her from that. As fascinating a figure as she was, she doesn't really exist outside that myth. I mean, look at the image of Rachel, Rachel Weiss here. You know, here she is. She's bruised. She's dirty. She's got her arms full of scrolls that she's hoping to save from the mob. You know, it's very much a stereotypical story. The movie actually connects her death specifically uh, to the destruction of the library. In this, in this case, it's the destruction of the Serapium. It's not about that. I mean, it was, as far as we can tell, it was about local Alexandrian politics. It was about her having too much influence over the, uh, the prefect. And the movie itself is beautifully shot as it is, and really, I would watch Rachel Weiss in anything, is sort of an anti-Christian morality play. So what I would conclude here by saying is that the story of the library is so powerful for us because it plays into our fears of societal destruction. You know, what happens if our greatest work is lost? What happens if our knowledge, our accomplishments as a civilization burn? It's the fear of a dark age, basically. So this is why we cling to the legend of the Library of Alexandria, and we don't necessarily look closely at the reality. But I do think that the library deserves to be seen as much as possible for what it was, not what we imagine it to be. All right, so we'll be back with uh, another lecture shortly. Thanks very much, guys.